Okay, thanks, Naomi. Uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce today's speaker, Jane Park from MIT. Jane joined Pablo Haria Herrero's group uh, in 2018 after completing her undergraduate education at Duke. Uh, and it didn't take her long to start uncovering some quite groundbreaking results on uh, multi-layer graphene moiré systems. Uh, some of Jane's previous experiments focused on thermodynamic measurements of twisted bilayer graphene, uh, which have provided important insights into a, a lot of aspects of the system, uh, including magnetic order, topological states, and even possible strange metal behavior system. Uh, I'd also like to add that she's been a, a wonderful collaborator to us in the Jacobi group, uh, working with us on uh, some spatially involved measurements of topological states uh, in twisted bilayer graphene. Today, her talk will focus on uh, some remarkable phenomena recently observed, uh, including robust unconventional superconductivity in a different moiré system, uh, namely a graphene trilayer. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Jane. Okay, Andrew, thanks for the introduction. And let me start sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, um, hi everyone. I'm Jongmin Park um, from MIT and also, I mean, Jane. And today I'll talk about the Moiré superconductivity in magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, um, which is a highly tunable Moiré system that our group has been working on. And I'll start from a pretty general introduction for a just general audience and then move towards um, our results on this new system. So everyone knows that electrons repel each other, but you know when it comes to solid state systems involving countless electrons, it's just not possible to consider all of these individual interactions between the electrons, since it would be just very difficult problem to solve um, in theory. And actually, in many of the conventional materials, such individual interaction can just be ignored to explain the macroscopic phenomena. So this so-called single particle band theory picture works very well in conventional materials like you know, regular insulators or metals and semiconductors. And you can explain conduction, you know, insulation very well, et cetera, of a material. But then in certain systems, electronic interactions are rather strong and you, know, you might not want to ignore that and because they might matter more. So for example, in such systems, you know, this kind of insulator state could form where it should have been metallic according to the single particle picture due to strong electronic repulsions. So this kind of you know, insulator transition would be called correlated insulator because it comes from strong electronic correlations. So this is just one very basic type of correlated system, just to have an idea. Um, and in reality, really variety of interesting quantum materials involve this kind of strongly correlated physics ranging from you know, high TC superconductors, fractional quantum hole effects, um, to quantum spin liquid, among many, many more others. And these are really fascinating systems, but again, are very difficult to solve theoretically as it involves you know, non-trivial many-body physics. So perhaps the one that has been investigated the most until now um, is the high temperature cuprate superconductors. So it has this copper oxide plane where you know, each copper site, these blue sites, has one electron. So in this case, due to the severe energy cost for one copper site to have two electrons, the electrons one would not really be hopping to the next site. And therefore, this becomes an insulator called the mod insulator. And when you remove you know, some electrons from this state to introduce some holes in the system, the non electrons can jump around um, to the empty sites. But they can also do it in a correlated way. And this, you know, surprisingly becomes a superconductor. So such control of, you know, number of electrons in these systems, it's called doping. And, you know, this dynamics of mod insulator can be captured well by this thing called Hubbard model. But in reality, you know, cuprate has a rich phase diagram in itself, um, a lot of states as a function of, you know, temperature and doping. And it's still under study to be able to theoretically explain, you know, all of these phenomena. So the conventional way to study this kind of you know, strongly correlated physics, well, not all of them, but for many, is to you know, synthesize these materials, um, which is a lot of possibilities with all these different combinations of the atoms and the periodic table. But oftentimes, you know, this type of system, as we just saw, 
we would want to be able to vary the number of charge carriers um, in the system, aka doping, as I said, and you know, study what different phenomena happen depending on such doping. Which makes sense as we're, you know, try to investigate the results of in electronic interactions in these systems. And as you can see in this cuprate phase diagram, obtaining this full phase diagram is very important for understanding, you know, what's going on in the system. But in terms of, you know, actual experiments, how you're going to do this experiment, um, it's it's it comes to, you know, this synthesizing this material, which is which basically means is that for every single point on this x x axis, um, called doping you need to make different samples, varying the ratio of these components of this compound and therefore controlling the free charge carriers in the system. And obviously this is a lot of work and you know, really limits the in situ tunability of the experiments. And just in general, like if you have an idea for interesting materials, you know, making new types of systems, even if you think there would be like interesting physics, it won't always work out so easily just because of the difficulty in the chemical synthetic side just that crystal like might not just form <laughs> when you try to grow it. So on the more controllable side, um, there's this cold atom system, which is basically, you know, putting atoms in this artificial lattice potentials made out of laser beams and try to, you know, mimic the real crystal lattice. So these are artificial lattice, um, which has a much, much larger, you know, um, length scale typically on the order of one micron. And this technique can be used to simulate, you know, similar kind of strongly correlated physics. And there have been a lot of interesting results from this. But, you know, this requires very low temperatures and like it's, it's not a real solid state material system. This is an artificial lattice. So it would definitely be interesting at this point to have, you know, a another materials platform, you know, in which we can investigate this correlated physics, but more you know, in a more tunable way. So at this point, let me um, introduce two-dimensional materials. So for certain materials, um, especially the layered materials, these three materials can be you know, thinned down to the two-dimensional atomic limit, as shown here. It's one sheet of atoms. These are called 2D materials, um, which can sh share similar or different properties from their 3D counterparts. So the main reason why these 2D materials are so attractive is that, you know, they not only exhibit very interesting properties just because, you know, they're <laughs> confined in this two-dimensional plane, but also, you know, they're extremely tunable in many, many different ways. So first of all, this doping process, you know, changing charge of carrier density in the system now becomes so much easier for the 2D materials because, you know, now you can just use the electrostatic effect um, by applying the gate voltage between the metallic gate nearby and this 2D material um, and control the doping. So what this really means is that, for example, for, you know, this kind of graphene band structure, which is the 2D material, um, as you gate the system, you move your Fermi level, you know, from here to up or down, you know, which is the same thing as controlling a charge carrier density or doping. And you can really tune from, you know, this kind of resistive state to conducting state and vice versa. And the same principle can be applied to, you know, other types of 2D materials with different band structures. Um, so, you know, what used to be requiring countless samples in order to um, dope little by little now just became, you know, in situ tuning just in one sample. So further tunability of these 2D materials comes from the fact that we can stack the 2D materials on top of each other using the van der Waals um, interactions. So, and we can stack any number of these 2D materials together to create a composite device um, and also control the chemical doping of that new system as well using the same electrostatic principles. So really the amazing thing is that we can break down the 3D materials into two dimensions and then just arrange them in any order that we want for these layers. Then we create a completely new structure, which is unique and just, you know, it never existed before. And they will have very different properties from, you know, any of these constituent layers. It's just a new, completely new system. And this stacking process is basically, in some sense, you can think of it as a new synthetic method. And it's not just stacking like Lego pieces just on top of each other, but there is also this twisting degree of freedom between the layers. As you can see here, um, as you twist one layer um, with respect to the other layer due to, due to the atomic lattice mismatch, um, there is this new pattern appearing, you know, called this Moiré pattern. 
And this, you can see this larger periodicity pattern as you twist you know, these patterns. Um, and this larger periodicity defines the new length scale of the system. And from this new length scale, interesting new phenomena can arise. So if you think of you know, how many different 2D materials there are as the constituent layers, and then the twist angle um, control between them, you can really imagine you know, there are so many different numerary systems that you can form um, with this new method. Okay, so what we're gonna focus on um, in this talk as a constituent layer is graphene, which has this honeycomb or you know, hexagonal lattice with carbon atoms. So these dots are all just carbon atoms, chemically equivalent, um, but you know, they're labeled with different colors because from a crystallographic point of view, they're not really equivalent since you know, this unit cell contains um, this two atom bases. So we labeled them as A and B sites. So if we look at the band structure of this graphene, it has a very interesting low energy dispersion. If you zoom in into this low energy part, you have this linear energy momentum dispersion relation called the Dirac dispersion. And this dispersion can be formalized in this type of Hamiltonian. You know, it's the same type of Hamiltonian as the 2D Dirac equation for massless particles. So in here, this each spinner um, usually refers to spin up or down of the electrons. But in our case of the graphene and this equation, this is just the pseudo spin, not the real spin arising from these two sub lattice um, symmetry. So it tells you that um, it tells you whether you know the weight of this wave function is concentrated on the A site or the B site. And graphene also has an equivalent K or K prime values um, with each with this kind of Dirac cone. So the important thing is that the graphene has fourfold degeneracy, um, and these two are coming from spins. And here I'm talking about the real spins, not the pseudo spin. And the other two are coming from these two valleys. So this is this number four is important for understanding the data later on. Um, and in terms of just you know electronic transport, this is just a semi-metal um, which is you know resistive when you're at this when your chemical potential is at this charge neutral direct point, and then it becomes more conducting when you dope away from that point. So now, um, what happens if we twist two sheets of graphene layers um, with a relative twist angle between them? So we saw that in the real space already, it forms this kind of moiré pattern that um, larger periodicity that we already saw in the previous slides. But you know what really happens in this momentum space to understand um, what's going on. So here we have these two Dirac electrons, um, Dirac cones, um, standing next to each other for you know small twist angle. And for now, in this picture, we haven't taken into consideration the coupling between the two layers. So nothing is really tunneling between the two layers. And now if we put that kind of um, coupling, what will happen to this electronic structure of the graphene? So let's consider some interaction between the layers. You know, then these cones now are gapped you know, by this um, amount that's proportional to this interaction strength between the layers. And now if we try to decrease the twist angle even further and make this coupling even stronger, you know, there will be a point at which you know, this coupling is comparable to the original energy of the crossing point. And at this point um, here, the bottom of the hybridized um, state is essentially pushed to zero energy and this low energy band becomes very, very flat. And when this flat band condition is reached, um, the Fermi velocity at this um, direct points will go to zero and the electron-electron electro interactions will be dominating. So in this graphene graphene structure, this so-called magic angle is around 1.1 degrees. So you basically have two flat bands in the system, these you know, two blue lines around the charge neutrality. Um, one is above the charge neutrality, the other one is below the charge neutrality. Um, and these are separated by the higher energy dispersive bands, which are in red by the single particle band gap. So here is just the band insulator from the hybridization. So you can understand this kind of flat band in the momentum space as the same thing as the localization of electrons in the real space. So what this means in the magic angle twisted bilayer graphene is that 
the electrons um, are known to reside at these A, A sites. So what I mean by A sites is that we have two layers of graphene and recall this A and B sublattice sites. A, A sites means, you know, the bottom layer A site on top of um, um, below the top layer A site. So electrons in these twisted bilayer graphene at the magic angle would be residing at these um, points kind of localized. And from these localized electrons, you can get this, you know, triangular lattice um, denoted by this yellow spots that I put um, with, you know, much larger periodicity than in graphene. So this little thing is the graphene atomic lattice, but then like now our land scale of the periodicity of the localized electrons will be more like 14.4 nanometers um, for this magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. So in 2018, it was discovered that if you place the chemical potential inside this flat band, which you know doesn't really have a gap within itself, just recall there is like no you know gap within each flat band, um, you know, but you know you can actually see that there is correlated insulators arising when you half fill the band. So again, you know what do I mean by this? Um, as I said, we have four electrons per Moiré unit cell. So what this means that means is that um, we need four electrons in order to fully fill one, you know, flat band and then reach that single particle band gap. So here is, you know, filling factor four. Um, and when we actually fill inside this, you know, if below the four electrons, you know, there is no gap in the single particle band picture. But then the experiment um, told you that, you know, when we fill two electrons per moirane cell, there is actually an insulating state. So this is the correlated insulator state on both, you know, electron doped and hole doped sides. And even more surprisingly, if you dope a little bit away from these insulators at the half filling, so this is the insulator, if you dope away a little bit on both sides, there was superconductivity. So here is this phase diagram um, showing this insulator and superconductors. And this exact mechanism you know, of these states are still under investigation. It's only been three years um, at this point. But again, I want to emphasize that this type of phase diagram is obtained in like one sample in one measurement since this 2D system has an advantage of electrostatic doping. We don't need to make samples in order to obtain each point here. And again, all of these phenomena um, are just not seen in regular graphene, obviously, um, without such magic twist. So this is really something that is created by twisting these layers. So now if we come back to the slides showing different platforms to study strongly correlated physics, now, we're, now there is this new platform of Moiré quantum matter, as we name, which has the length scale and temperature scale that lie between um, the two existing platforms, but also with really great in-situ tunability. You know, and people have already created many different types of Moiré quantum matter, probably, you know, even more than what I listed here, um, with a variety of correlated magnetic and topological phenomena. But one very interesting thing is that, you know, until pretty recently, um, this robust superconductivity was only reproducibly seen in twisted bilayer graphene, even though you know many of these other systems also have flat bands. So it is quite interesting to know, you know, what aspect of this magic angle twisted bilayer graphene is important for forming such robust superconductivity. You know, is it its special type of flat band, or there is some important symmetry in the system that really um, is important for forming the superconductivity, etc. Um, so this is like an interesting current research question to ask. And so just to show, you know, what, what I mean by robust superconductivity is that, you know, it has to have a combination of absolutely zero or zero resistance and sharply switching VI curves and the show system phase coherence, also known as the Fraunhofer pattern. So although, you know, there are reports of, of, of signatures of superconductivity in other types of Moiré systems, you know, the robust kind of superconductivity that encompasses all these features was reproducibly measured only in the magic angle twisted bilographene by many different groups until, you know, pretty recently, um, until we discovered this new system um, that is another robust Moray superconductor, which I'm going to talk about today. Okay. <clears throat> and today I'll introduce a new Moray system that we have been exploring, namely the magic angle twisted, you know, trilayer graphene. So as you can see in this illustration, um, the system consists of three layers of graphene where the adjacent layers are twisted by theta and now also minus theta. 
such that the top and bottom layers of graphene um, are just aligned, and the middle layer is at a relative twist angle with respect to the top and bottom layers, um, which is keeping this mirror symmetry of the entire thing in a global sense. So if you put mirror in this mi middle layer, um, it's symmetric, and in addition to the um, C2T symmetry. So this system also has a defined you know, magic angle of around now 1.56 degrees, which is quite larger than the twisted bilayer graphene, um, which I'll explain more later how this resulted. And here, you know, we're thinking of a structure where the top and bottom layers are not just aligned in terms of angle, but also just atomically aligned, um, like A sites on top of A sites. And the system structure was first um, proposed by Ashton's group at Harvard in 2019. So how do we understand this system? So let me first tell you the result. So the result is that you can think of this trilayer system um, as a combination of twisted bilayer graphene, but you know, with larger interlayer tunneling and a separate monolayer graphene. So if you actually think about how you would calculate this band structure, it's not actually, it's not very trivial to have this conclusion because you know, this, is, this is just another system with a different twist angle and you know, all three layers are all interacting. So you can't just you know, manually just do it two plus one um, by no reason um, usually. But in this particular case, such breakdown into the two plus one is possible um, because of the mirror symmetry of this system. So when you write down the Hamiltonian for this trilayer system, it's initially just three by three matrix with you know, off diagonal elements. So, but then it can be actually block diagonalized to result in this form where you know, there is the twisted bilayer graphene part and then there's a pristine you know, <clears throat> monolayer graphene part which is protected by this mirror symmetry of the system. Um, but when, you know, but here you can actually see that here there is a square root of two factor that came in. So you can achieve the flat band and the Dirac band um, in this band structure, but then add a larger magic angle of 1.56 degrees um, that is square root of two higher than the bilayer graphene case. So this larger magic angle means smaller Moiré length of around nine nanometers compared to the 14 nanometers of twisted bilayer graphene. And in, in this system, in terms of you know, the band structure, you know, it has a similarity with the bilayer graphene in a sense that you know, it also has this flat band. Um, but then you know, there are, they have different Moiré length scale. This one has this extra Dirac band and consequently many other different phenomena as you will see throughout this talk. So another fundamental difference is that um, in this trilayer system, we gain another tuning knob compared to the bilayer graphene case, which is this electric field, um, electric displacement field tunability. <clears throat> we can now put dual gates um, both on top and bottom and simultaneously, not just one gate. So the bilayer graphene was just a single gated thing. Now we put two gates on top and bottom and simultaneously control this displacement field D D in addition to the charge density that we usually control. So shown here are the band structures that we calculated um, of the system um, in the absence and presence of the displacement field. So when there is like no displacement field, as you can see in the previous slide, um, you have this flat band, <clears throat> which is orange, and this pristine Dirac band. And like they're not interacting because it's protected by the symmetry. But you know, as you apply this displacement field in transverse direction, you are breaking this mirror symmetry, um, so that this high um, flat band and this Dirac band um, start hybridizing, and you know, you can really control the width and the interaction of this system in situ, um, in addition to the usual you know charge carrier density control. Okay, so. The first thing we did in this experiment was confirming that our system indeed has the proposed electronic structure that I described. Like, did we create the right thing that we're thinking, um, that we're exploring? So here is our lambda fan of up to two Tesla. Um, so the y-axis is this magnetic field in the perpendicular direction to our 2D plane. And this x-axis is called the filling factor, which basically refers to the number of electrons per molar unit cell, as I said. So again, um, let me emphasize fully filling this four electrons. And this is where you're going to reach the end of the flat band um, and reach that band insulator. 
So I plotted here some you know, derivative quantity um, to emphasize the features that I want to show you. And basically, um, you know, in addition to these features at integer filling factors, you can clearly see this new feature that's, you know, um, extra set of Dirac Landau levels at the boundaries. So these are the Landau levels of this extra pristine Dirac band. And, you know, we can take a line cut at this density and confirm that, you know, it indeed possesses the correct sequence for just pristine Dirac electron, um, very well quantized. Um, and then at finite displacement field, you know, we experimentally see that, you know, there is no more of these signatures of extra um, Dirac Landau levels, which is exactly what we expected from this band structure since they're gone um, by the hybridization. So now we know that we have created a structure that we think um, we're studying. And then, you know, the first finding is that, you know, there is robust superconductivity in this system. So at the optimal doping and displacement field, I'm just showing one curve, um, the critical temperature is around 2.9 Kelvin and the BKT transition temperature is around 2.3 Kelvin, both um, slightly higher than the twisted biographene and along with this sharply switching um, BI curves. Um, and again, this is an electrically tunable superconductor, and you can see that the superconducting domes, um, you know, here and here, as you vary the temperature versus the integer filling factor, you know, mainly near the filling factor of plus minus two. So these are again taken at a particular fixed displacement field um, and only varying the density. So like in our system, since it's so tunable, like we would be obtaining just thousands of these plots at, at different displacement fields if we want to. I'm just showing you one cut. So on this whole side, um, there is this larger dome and this smaller dome and electron side is small, um, is similar. And the strength of these domes, as you'll see later, are really highly dependent on the displacement fields. And then the last check for the robustness of the superconductivity, we applied some magnetic field in the perpendicular direction. And you know, you can see the suppression of the superconductivity. This is um, DVDI over um, I curve. Um, and this has this very long tail, but it gets suppressed you know, in the magnetic field. And this, this type of response is what we see deep inside the superconducting dome, you know, where it's just very robustly superconducting um, near the optimal doping. And near the edge of the dome where, you know, there is this also resistive state close by, um, we find this Josephson interference pattern, which is, you know, the last check that I mentioned for um, confirming that it's a true superconductor. Okay, so we know that this system is a true superconductor. But OK, <laughs> um, but there is many more to it than that. So here I'm showing the full phase space of this magic angle twisted trilographene um, here. And this is the resistance map as a function of filling factor again, new, um, and this displacement field. So now you can see this effect of the displacement field in addition to the charge doping effect. So this y-axis. Um, was not really present in the twisted bilayer So, you know, it used to be just only this axis in the bilayer wrapping case. So the system really added another dimension to explore, which obviously has, you know, a lot of dependencies. And here, this color bar for resistance scale, and basically this light below region is referring to the superconductivity. Um, and this yellow region is a relatively more resistive um, state. So there are many different features that I wouldn't really focus in this talk, but basically, you know, there are, you know, some sort of resistive features near the integer filling factors in the system. Um, and then in particular in the regions near the filling factor of plus minus two, around this region, um, there is, you know, large areas of superconductivity whose, you know, boundary shape is really dependent on the displacement field. So we'll um, take a deeper look into that later. And like, you can see that it has a really rich set of states that are controllable with these two axes, um, you know, electron doped and hold doped sites look kind of similar, but different. And the positive and negative displacement fields have essentially the same effect, which makes sense for the mirror symmetric system. <laughs> so in order to better understand these phases, we measured the whole density. 
So shown here is the full um, map in the phase space of the whole density, um, showing mainly three type of features. So I'll um, guide you through how to read this plot. So the first type would be the thing called gap or dirac like behavior, where the whole density just linearly crosses zero. And as you can see, you know, this happens around, you know, the dirac point itself and at integer filling factors at certain displacement fields. And the second type is the so-called reset type of behavior, where the density was like increasing, but then it suddenly drops to zero and then resumes filling. So this type of behavior is um, observed at integer filling factors in the system at small displacement field. So what I'm referring to in terms of this color plot is that when you look here, um, as you increase the density, this color was getting redder and redder and redder, which means the density was increasing. But then at some point, it becomes this white um, part, which is zero. So this type of behavior is what I call as reset. And similar thing is happening um, on this holdup side in the blue region. And the last type is the Bainhoff singularity, um, where the whole density diverges, actually, and changes sign. So this time it goes to plus infinity and then comes back from the minus infinity. So this usually is a signature of Fermi surface reconstruction, and you can see this feature, feature at high displacement fields um, here in this system. <clears throat> so let's look at these two plots again, side by side. And we can actually find you know, striking correlations in the features in resistance and in the whole density. Especially notable is you know, the shape of the superconducting boundaries and the whole density features. So let's take a closer look at what's going on here. So here is an illustration of the superconducting regions shown in like below. Um, and gap and Dirac feature in the whole density, um, I mark it with pink. And then the resetting feature is marked with orange. And finally, the Vanhoff singularities are with the blue lines. And surprisingly, you can see that these Vanhoff singularity lines and the resetting lines um, are bounding these superconductivity um, very well, like in most parts. In other words, the superconductivity, you know, ends at this fan of singularity feature. This is actually pretty counterintuitive because, you know, in a normal BCS type conventional superconductors, this band of singularity is where, you know, this is where the density of states are um, supposed to diverge. And for such conventional super superconductors, it should be the strongest point for the superconductivity, not where it dies. So it has the opposite type of behavior from what we would expect from the known um, conventional type of superconductors. Okay, so something weird is going on. So we went to study you know, this boundary more closely. So now if we tuck the line cut at this particular displacement field as shown by these lines, and then you, know, you can see that this resistance um, starts becoming non-zero at this point. Um, and this TC, TBKT also drops to zero at this exact same point. And at this same point, the effective mass we measured is actually showing a divergence. So this we can confirm that this is the Van Hoff singularity where the density of state um, diverges. And this is also where the superconductivity gets suppressed and bounded. This is very interesting because it's not just that the superconductivity just you know, somehow ends here, but you know, the TC gradually decreases and becomes zero exactly at this point. So from this, we learned that the robust superconductivity in magic angle to trilographene cannot really be consistent with the weak coupling um, BCS type of superconductor. So we wanted to further investigate the coupling nature of the superconductivity. Um, so we obtained the map of BKT transition temperature um, in the entire phase space as shown here. So this is this displacement field and this filling factor, and we map out the TC um, in this entire region. And you can you know, clearly see how the strength of the superconductivity is tunable upon you know, carrier density and displacement field. And across you know, these two white lines, um, which represent varying the displacement field as a, at a constant density and vice versa um, around the region of the highest TBKT temperatures. So we took a deeper look um, across these lines to see what's going on. Okay, so if this superconductivity is not really weakly coupled, then you know the natural thing is now thinking about the strong coupling regime. So um, for those of you who are more general audience, what I mean by strong coupling is that the electrons that consist the Cooper pairs for the superconductivity are tightly bound, unlike in you know in 
regular weak coupling BCS type superconductor, these Cooper pairs, these electrons in the Cooper pair are kind of very far apart, you know, compared to the average interparticle distance of the electrons. So now we're suspecting, okay, like in our system, does that mean these um, electrons in the Cooper pairs are really tightly bound? So shown here is the superconducting dome in the hold up side showing the BKT temperature, you know, as a function of filling factor and, you know, along the displacement, constant displacement field that I, you know, pointed out in the previous map. Okay, so along this line, we measured this ginzburg landau coherence length, this pink thing, um, which is basically kind of representing the, you know, maximum um, distance uh, within the Cooper pair. Um, this trend is inversely proportional to the TBKT, and we can see that this system exhibits extremely short coherence length in the order of like 12 nanometers. Um, for comparison, the value for MATBG um, that's reported was 50 nanometers, so this is much, much shorter than that. And indeed, this trend in this underdoped region here um, follows the same curve as this interparticle distancing, so this um, red the particle is the interparticle average interparticle distancing in the system, um, you know, considering the Moiré length scale and the electron density, um, we computed this value. So you can really see that these two scales are really similar and in the order of each other. And as a function of displacement field, you know, this trend is inversely, again, proportional to this TBKT and reaching this interparticle distancing limit again. So this clearly shows that the Cooper pair size um, must be on the order of or smaller than the average inner particle distance, you know, suggesting that we're in this ultra strong coupling regime of superconductivity. So this reminds us about the regime of BCSBC -BC crossover, where the Cooper pair size um, is in the order of the interparticle distance. So in this regime, the TC is limited by the superfluid density and not the microstructure of the density of states in the BCS sense. So it's not about the gap, but more about the superfluid density. So this in this BC regime, um, it can be characterized by the superconducting transition temperature versus the Fermi temperature, this ratio, which is proportional um, to the ratio of the superfluid density over the carrier density. So this ratio basically in simple words tells the strength of the superconducting coupling. Um, for the three-dimensional systems, you can derive that um, this ratio has the limit of around 0.22 if you're in the BC regime. For two-dimensional systems, it's defined with the BKT transition temperature instead um, with the ratio of around 0.125 if we assume that the boson mass to be um, twice as the fermion. Okay, so in order to know the proximity to such crossover regime, we also measured effective mass um, across the same region um, and calculated this ratio of TBKT over TF, because TF, um, we got it from the effective mass. Um, and we did the same thing for the displacement field dependence. And as I said, for 2D, um, this limit um, is around 0.1 for this ratio. And we found that our ratio is actually extremely close to, if not almost right there at this limit. Um, and these serve as another evidence to show that we're at this ultra strong coupling regime where, you know, possibly close to the BCSBC -BC crossover, where again, our maximum TC is limited by the superfluid density and not the microstructure of the density of states in the BCS sense. So in this, you know, type of Uemura plot, basically showing the ratio of this, you know, TC over TF um, between different materials. So basically the systems that are close to this bounding line that we um, saw before, they are considered extremely strongly coupled superconductors. And you can see that our new system MATTG lies here, which is, you know, the closest to this limiting bound in all the reported systems. And this places um, the MATTG as the most ultra strong coupling superconductor known to date. So where is this superconductivity rising from? Um, recall this phase diagram where, you know, there are regions of superconductivity around new equal to plus minus two. But why is it the case that some regions have superconductivity, you know, here and then other regions don't and stuff like that? So for example, at small displacement field, this superconductivity only occurs between this new equal to two to three and only in this region. But then at higher displacement field, like here, there are also new regions of superconductivity that's not just in this region. 
So we already saw that this superconductivity is bounded by these Van Hoff singularity lines. But in addition to that, it's also sort of bounded by the resetting um, lines. So what, what does this kind of thing imply about the origin of our superconductivity? So we took a closer look um, at the perpendicular magnetic field dependence, also known as the Landau fan. Just to remind you, the superconductivity at you know small displacement field, you know again happened between e equal to two to three. So we're talking about this region around two to three, and here um, in this Landau fan, you can see that you know where the regions of superconductivity was in the um, phase diagram, it matches precisely matches where the carriers you know from the new equal to two state dominate. So the fans are all um, resulting from the new equal to two state in this region for a small displacement field. And it matches with where the superconductivity appears. So, you know, um, and at this small displacement field, you know, these fans go outward. And then what happens to is it is it is that it eventually meets these outward fans from new equal to three states, these green ones. Um, and then, you know, this is precisely referring to the reset type of behavior that we saw in the phase diagram. And indeed, superconductivity happens only between this region until you meet this other type of carriers from new equal to three and you know, at this resetting point. Um, but now, when we try to apply large enough displacement field, we saw that you know, there were other regions of superconductivity you know, at, uh, between actually new equal to one to two, not just two to three. So let's look at this Landau fan. Um, here, you know, now you see that these, these fans from new equal to two or plus minus two, it's not just going outward, but you see these inward fans as well um, at this large displacement field, um, which eventually meet the outward going fans from new equal to plus minus one. And in this region is where we see that extra superconductivity that appears at large displacement field. Um, and this is also where the Bainhoff singularity bounding is happening. And such behavior is really consistently seen throughout the entire phase diagram. Um, where, so basically what I mean is where there is superconductivity, you know, we see the effective carriers from new equal to plus minus two and no others and vice versa. And when the type of carrier changes from the ones from new equal to plus minus two um, to the ones that are from the other fillings three or one, the superconductivity no longer exists. Again, you know, this is consistently the case at different places in the entire um, phase space. Okay, this is just a zoom in of um, showing that there are inward fans here. <coughs> so we can nicely summarize such data into these types of illustrations. So at small displacement field, there are only, you know, resetting type of behaviors and the superconductivity happens between equal to two and three only. But then in this intermediate D, you start seeing the inward fans from both mu equal to two and other fillings as well, um, where the outward and inward fans meet um, are, you know, they define the Van Hoff singularity. And again, the superconductivity appears exactly um, where there are fans from the mu equal to plus minus two. And, the, and they disappear when it changes to the carriers from other types of fillings, um, whether it's by resetting or Van Hoff singularity. And this behavior is even more pronounced at large displacement field, um, where there are you know, even wider regions of super extra superconducting regions upon you know, minus doping from the plus minus two state. So these data really show that this superconductivity is you know, non-trivially related to the carriers that are um, coming from the equal to two broken symmetry state. Okay, so this setup experiment makes us wanna explore the nature of the superconductivity, you know, what, in other words, you know, the symmetry of the order parameters of the superconducting state. So there are two parts, um, the first one being the spatial symmetry, referring to the variation of the order parameter along the Fermi surface as a function of, you know, momentum K. And this symmetry could be classified as, you know, S, P, or D wave, or, you know, any combination of these um, symmetries. And there is also the spin configuration referring to the pairing of the spins of the Cooper pair, which can form either the singlet state or the triplet state. So how would we study this kind of spin configuration of the superconducting order parameter? So let's think of applying magnetic field. And of course, you know, there is always some orbital effect in the magnetic field. But for now, let's just, you know, let's just assume that somehow we could apply a purely Zeeman type of field without any vortex creation to kill a superconductivity. 
So in most superconductors, these Cooper pairs have this um, spin singlet pairing. And for conventional superconductors, the binding energy of your Cooper pairs, also called the gap, is given by this formula, um, some constant times kvtc. And you know, because of the Zeeman effect, it splits the spins up and up or down from this Cooper pair. And this means that this purely Zeeman field will eventually um, break this singlet type of Cooper pair by the Zeeman effect. Um, and then once you split the pair by the Zeeman gap, you would expect the superconductivity to disappear if it was the spin singlet pairing. So this thing is called the Pauli limit. Uh, and if you put the formulas from the conventional superconductors here, um, um, you will get this Pauli limit um, that's equal to 1.86 times the superconducting transition temperature. So what this means is that, for example, um, for a superconductor of um, transition temperature of around one Kelvin, um, we would expect that the superconductivity will be killed by applying the Zeeman field of around 1.86 Tesla if it were this type of conventional spin singlet Cooper pairing. So we tested this, you know, what happens to our magic null twisted trilographing system um, if we apply magnetic field that's in parallel direction as the two dimensional place, plane so that it's like pseudo, you know, purely Zeeman. There will be some orbital effect, but still it would be quite um, Zeeman. So this plot is, you know, what the phase diagram looks like um, at the zero magnetic field. As you know, this superconductivity has a TC of around 2.7 Kelvin. Um, you know, <clears throat> we expected the Pauli limit where you know this superconductor superconductivity will be killed would be around five Tesla if it were the same type of BCS spin singlet superconductivity. Okay, and then we went all the way up to you know 10 Tesla in flame field. But then we found that you know the superconductivity, although it you know decreased in terms of the region, you know there was still superconductivity at ten Tesla. Okay, so we can confirm that the state at the ten Tesla is you know is a true superconducting state, not just some random low resistance state, by measuring this you know IV characteristic as always. And here you know as you vary the in-plane magnetic field, so here you can see that. Although the critical current decreases, there is always this flat region near the zero bias and a step up, you know, at, to a resistive state at a finite, you know, critical current, which is the signature of a true superconductor. We can also study the evolution um, of the extent of the superconductivity on the hold of the side as a function of, you know, magnetic field. So each plane here is, you know, an ND map. Um, near the superconducting state, and we apply, you know, two, four, six, eight, and ten Tesla in plane field, and you know, you know that you, you see this extent of superconductivity is decreasing, but then it still remains clearly at ten Tesla. So now, in order to determine how much the Pauli limit is by exceeded, you know, we measured its temperature dependence. So this time, this each plane that I <laughs> plot is a resistance map as a function of temperature and filling factor at a finite, you know, particular displacement field, fixed one. And we again show the cuts at different, you know, magnetic fields in the in-plane direction. And you can see here that the TC, you know, gradually it does decrease, but it's just, you know, it's still obviously a finite TC of around, you know, 1.3 Kelvin, even at 10 Tesla. So now we want to take another cut. Now, even at just fixed density, only varying, you know, the magnetic field and temperature for a particular density and displacement field, um, <laughs> showing just the, you know, typical resistance map. So shown here is the constant resistance contour. These lines um, here representing the evolution of the TC as a function of, you know, magnetic field in the in-plane direction. Since the definition of TC can be a little bit, you know, ambiguous um, in these systems, we took three different percentages of the normal state resistance to see, you know, if there's any difference. Um, we find that all of these contours, you know, roughly follow the Ginsburg-Landau expression, which tells you that the TC decreases quadratically with the application of the B parallel. So by extrapolating these curves, we can get the critical magnetic field at zero temperature and then compare it to the nominal Pauli limit um, shown here. So this is the Pauli limit that you would expect from our 
critical temperatures if our system was a spin singlet. Um, and you can see that, you know, obviously there is a large difference between what we experimentally see and what you would expect. So we find a large, you know, Pauli limit violation of uh, the ratio being around, you know, three in all three cases whatsoever um, threshold that you use to extract, extract the TC. So how do we understand this large Pauli violation? So many systems um, where such thing is observed, you know, actually usually exhibit, you know, spin orbit coupling. Um, you know, such as in the case of niobium diselenide um, or molybdenum disulfide, you know, meaning that, you know, in these systems, this strong spin orbit coupling leads to the polyunit violation, you know, even though they are a spin singlet. But then, you know, graphene has a really small spin orbit coupling, and it's, it's a known fact that it has a very small value. And you know, our system matching angle twisted trial graphene is just three layers of graphene in which, you know, there is just not much reason to believe that there will be a significant spin orbit coupling. And if we were to be, I mean, if it were to be the main reason for our power limit violation, that spin orbit coupling, you know, would have to be very, very <laughs> greatly enhanced and like in the order of magnitude higher than what it will be. Okay. So this is a quite, you know, unlikely mechanism, you know, there's just no evidence to believe such will be the case in our system, um, according to the current theory. You know, and then in addition to the spin or recoupling, there is another thing called, you know, finite momentum pairing. So this is called FFLO state. So usually your Cooper pairs have opposite momentum of, you know, spin up from the momentum K and spin down from the minus K. So that, you know, the net momentum of your Cooper pair will be zero. But in certain superconductors, when you apply in-plane field, you can realize you know, finite momentum pairing in the absence of spin or recoupling. So in this kind of state, um, this can lead to the violation of the Pauli limit by you know, 20 to 40% at very, very low temperatures, much lower than the superconducting transition temperature. Um, so it would have this kind of shape. But, you know, considering that our system has a violation of around, you know, three times, not like 20% only, um, and it also happens, you know, near the TC, not just at very, very low temperature, this type of mechanism is, again, pretty unlikely mechanism for our observation. So you can compare, you know, what our data look like with this FFLO type of um, thing, and, you know, they look quite different. So another thing we need to consider is the effect of the pseudo gap. So we have shown in our you know, previous slides that our superconductivity in this system can be tuned to extremely strong coupling regime close to the BCS-BC crossover. But near this regime, it is possible, you know, it's called pseudo gap. Um, it is possible that the gap delta is just much greater than the KBTC, the assumption that we used for computing the Pauli limit for the spin singlet. So recall that in our system, you know, oh, okay it might be just much larger. And if you actually do that, it means that if you try to calculate the Pauli limit using such gap, um, that would be just much larger than the Pauli field that we calculated using the 1.86 um, TC. So recall that in our system, this strong coupling regime was reached you know, around this optimal doping here. And it was quite tunable, you know, how, how much coupling it has, it was quite tunable um, as a function of displacement field and also um, the carrier density. So if our Pauli limit violation behavior is also highly dependent on density like this, following this kind of shape, you know, we might have to suspect that it could indeed be from this pseudo gap, but still having the spin singlet. And now, okay, here is our poly violation ratio over the entire, you know, over the, the same density um, region. So, and it is just very obviously just not resembling the shape of this T B K T over T F, and it's consistently violating um, by a factor of you know two to three in the entire superconducting dome, even where this T B K T over T F. Like here, it's an order of magnitude smaller than the optimal value, but it's you know, still similarly violating. So we can say that this pseudo gap is also a pretty unlikely um, um, to be the sole reason for such poly violation in our system. So some of you might still have some questions about you know, eliminating these three possible mechanisms. And here we have another signature. 
So all the previous data were taken at this optimal displacement field, meaning you know, highest TC points um, denoted by these dots here. So now if we try to lower the displacement field um, and just measure something around like here below this optimal displacement field, this is what we find. Again, this is a similar type of plot as before showing the you know, resistivity versus employment magnetic field and temperature. Note that the magnetic field scale is starting from five Tesla. So like actually to zero Tesla, it would continue all the way down here. Um, so this blue region is a zero resistance region. Um, and, you know, meaning this is a superconducting phase. And what we find is that once the superconductivity is killed at around eight Tesla, a new type of superconductivity um, just reappears at this higher um, in-plane magnetic field. So we call this low field and the high field re um, re state as the SC1 and SC2 states respectively, um, possibly with different types of order parameters. So we see this kind of behavior both in this critical temperature and also critical current. And this is a robust behavior and this is repeatable throughout the like throughout different measurements. So this type of reentrant superconducting behavior um, was previously seen in a series of compounds that contain uranium, which are suspected to have you know, some sort of, it could have some spin triplet superconductivity. And a common feature in these compounds, and especially this um, uranium telluride recently shown here, has a very close by you know, ferromagnetic phase. And people suspect that the spin fluctuations um, from this ferromagnetic phase might be responsible for forming the possible spin triplet superconductivity in these uranium compounds. Um, and again, you know, for this type of diagram, different materials in this family constituted um, this axis for controlling the magnitude of the spin fluctuations. Now in our new system, we don't need to change the chemical composition. We just need to change the displacement field um, or density to tune from states that have you know, re-entrant superconductivity you know, upon in-plane magnetic field, or there are regions that don't really exhibit the re-entrant superconductivity. So we can just continuously explore the transition between the SC1 and ST, SC, SC2 phases. Um, so this type of diagram that I showed for characterizing the poly limit violation or, you know, this re-entrant superconductivity, you know, just continuous cuts of these can be taken, um, you know, at any, you know, fixed point in this kind of diagram. So even these two diagrams are just not showing the full face space of our system as you know, there are cuts as a function of displacement field while fixing um, new or vice versa. So, I mean, in reality, the, these two should be constituting just its own independent axes. So, you know, the full one would be a four dimensional plot and you can really see that there is really a lot to explore in this um, space in terms of these, you know, different types of superconductivity and the transitions. Okay, um, so in summary, I have shown you that this magic angle twisted trilayer graphene system is a new robust Moray superconductor with you know, exceptional tunability. Um, we could reach this ultra strong coupling regime of superconductivity and saw that the poly limit um, is largely violated everywhere in the phase space. And there is also re superconductivity in certain phase spaces, um, which suggests that this system could have a possible spin triplet pairing, although you know, we didn't directly show. So in the future, it would be meaningful to study, you know, more directly um, the superconducting order parameter and see, you know, if there are other Moiré systems that exhibit um, other robust superconductivity so that, you know, we can understand the origin of such superconductivity better. So with that, I would like to thank my advisor, um, Pablo, and my collaborator, Yuan, and you know, many, many, many meaningful discussions with our theory friends, and of course, um, all these funding agencies, including the CIQM. Thank you. Okay, thank you for a very nice talk, Jane. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions, so I'll invite the audience members to please send any questions you have, either to the chat or the Q&A, and I'll read them out. Uh, in the meantime, there were a couple of questions that came in uh, during your talk that I can start with. Uh, the first question, which was only sent to the hosts and panelists, was uh, addressing, I think, twist angle disorder and uh, lattice relaxation. How would the ripples or twiddle of the graphene layers influence uh, the superconductivity behavior 
since the graphene layer structure could not be perfect. Um, okay, so in terms of just overall, just graphene layer being, I don't know if I have such slide, but we can, um, let me try to bring if I have the AFM images. Maybe I don't have it, but it's in our paper. But basically um, what I'm saying is that like when we try to make these devices, we carefully examine with the AFM, with our field optical microscope images and just make sure there is no obvious, you know, just, you know, ripples or bubbles in the structure where we make the device. So, I mean, we checked as much as we can do. And I agree that even if we do that and there is just no obvious just ripples or something, there might still be twist angle disorder, which is probably likely. But as you can see in our, you know, um, face space map, which let me bring it here, um, like in the displacement field dependence, it's actually pretty symmetric in the positive side and minus side. Um, which also, you know, shows that, and these features are very, you know, sharp in terms of the density. So it kind of shows that in terms of the angle, it would be pretty homogeneous in, in at least in the region where our device is located. And also the top and top, middle and bottom layers are probably quite symmetrically, mirror symmetrically um, aligned because we see this um, pretty symmetric behavior in the displacement field. And um, I want to mention that we also do have more um, disordered devices that I haven't shown here, but it is included in our um, paper um, in the extended data figures. And in, even in those slightly more disordered um, devices, they still have robust superconductivity. So up until now, um, we have measured three or four devices um, only, and then all of them were superconducting. So it had a hundred percent rate of robust superconductivity. So um, I don't think in terms of robustness of the superconductivity, it affects too much, um, even if there is slight twist angle disorder. So the global behavior is still preserved. Great, uh, okay. Uh, there were a couple other questions in, in the chat, but I think you addressed them uh, along the way. Uh, during your talk. Uh, there was one in the Q&A that uh, I could turn to uh, regarding fabrication. The question is, in your supplement, you state that you stack the graphene at room temperature. Do you see a noticeable difference between stacking at room temperature versus, say, around 80 Celsius, in particular in regard to sample yield, twist angle relaxation, et cetera? Um, that's actually a pretty difficult question to um, answer because, you know, I haven't done really just um, controlled experiment just bearing only that, but um, I usually prefer, <laughs> if you ask my preference, I usually prefer to do it at room temperature because it really gives you better control of your PC slide in terms of approaching the graphene layers, which really removes, you know, I think it does remove bubbles and possible strains in the stacks. So compared to like 80 or 90 degrees Celsius, which I don't know if it's just ours, but usually at that kind of temperature, like it's harder to control the wave front. So I prefer to do it at room temperature. And I do think it is consistently working pretty well. OK, thank you. I, I think that uh, addresses it. So unless anyone wants to quickly send a final question, I think we can wrap up now. Great. Um, thank you so much. That was a fabulous talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> bye bye. bye thank everybody. you, Andrew. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> nice talk.